Welcome to an all-new episode of Get Lit with Leanna, the podcast. Join me as I sit down with a new guest author in each episode to discuss their books, careers, and everything in between. Today's episode is so special because it's unlike anything I've done before. I'm actually joined with the co-creator of Degrassi and the executive producer of the show, Linda Schuyler and Stephen Stone, to talk all about Degrassi, the genesis of the show, the characters I've loved so much since I was young, my favorite storylines, and so many other fun behind-the-scenes stories about the creation of the show. The reason why they're on today is is because Linda Schuyler, who's the co-creator of the show, actually just wrote a memoir called The Mother of All Degrassi, which is available for everyone to buy right now. It's an amazing story about Linda's resilience and how she was able to create such an incredible series that has changed and impacted the lives of so many young people today. So without further ado, if you're a Degrassi fan like me, this is a must-listen, must-watch episode. My conversation with the creators of Degrassi starts right now. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so, so excited to have you both because I'm not sure how much you know about me, but I grew up like many Canadians and many people, I think all over the world, loving Degrassi. Like it was my favorite, favorite, favorite show growing up to the point where now I'm in my late twenties and I mean, DVDs are obsolete. So I have all of the next generation seasons on DVD that are just like sitting beautifully, like in my parents' house in my old bedroom. But now I'm watching them online again, rewatching it. So I'm re-falling in love. But I'm so excited to chat with you both because this show had such a pivotal part on my growing up. And I can't wait to get to ask you so many of my questions. But obviously, the reason why we're here is because, Linda, you have a new book, a new memoir that just came out. And typically on my show, I really speak mostly to authors like of the romance genre. That's like what my bread and butter is. But a lot of my audience love pop culture and love entertainment. And when I first posted about your book, I got so many messages from people like obviously in Canada, but even in the States that are watching the show and rewatching and they all are dying. Can't wait for this episode. Can't wait to read the book. So I'm so excited to have you both here. This is so much fun. Well, and Leanna, can I ask you, who is your favorite character? Okay. Well, I have a controversial opinion. (laughs) Okay. I had the biggest crush ever on Peter. Ever. Oh, that's okay. I thought you were going to say um, it was somebody like, um, you know, Emma and Spinner getting married. It was Spinner was your crush or no, something uh, like that. I, no, no. And I would go, no, no. No, I had a huge crush on Jamie to the point where I was probably in grade seven or grade eight. I don't remember what year, what grade I was in that year. Like he was on the show like the main character on the show, but like I had photos of him in my locker and all my friends had pictures of like international celebrities. Like I'm trying to think who was comparable at the time. And I just had like Degrassi cutouts in my locker. Like I was so obsessed, so obsessed. I mean, obviously Jimmy for like my whole life, I've been obsessed. I mean, I love Drake now as a rapper who doesn't love Drake, but like his character, I actually have a very funny story in one of the DVDs. There's like an EPK bonus questionnaire thing happening and one of the questions is they're they're asking Shane and Aubrey together a question and Aubrey goes I concur and I was like what does that mean I probably <laughs> <was> 11 <laughs> and I literally had to look in a physical dictionary to learn what the word concur means I know every time I say it or read it I think back to that moment which is so random <laughs> but, but Melinda you were there at the very, very first time when Aubrey entered the audition room. And I, I wasn't there, but you were there. So I, I need to know about that. Like, tell me about the audition. I mean, obviously for Aubrey, but for all of these characters that now have gone on and done so many amazing things. I mean, I'm currently in a binge rewatch of The Vampire Diaries. I love Nina. I love yeah. 90210, like Sinead. Like, all of these people that have gone on and done amazing things outside of Degrassi. Like, what were those auditions like? Well, Stephen alluded to um, Aubrey Graham's first audition, and it was quite interesting because um, we, our show, as you know, is an ensemble show. It's not really a, a star system, and we were casting for the Next Generation, and we had cast. Um, we, we'd been doing really well. We got at least ten characters cast, but we were having no luck finding Jimmy Brooks, and we we called back out to agents and, and said, "Please, we're looking for somebody who could be, you know, an athlete and charismatic and mm-hmm. and." Uh, And one of our agents called in and said, well, look, my son's got this friend. He hasn't had really any acting experience, but he's kind of cute. You might like to meet him, right? We said, please, yeah, send him in. (laughs) So Aubrey Graham sits down in front of the camera 
does his piece. And there's four of us lined up along the table and we're listening and listening. And then he finishes and it's kind of quiet in the room. And he goes, what? Did I goof it up? Can I do it again, please? And we said, no, it's fine. You can go now. He said, no, I'll really do it again. No, no, you can go now. It's fine. So he jumps up and wanting to shake our hands and he kind of knocks the light stand over and the PA (laughs) lights in. And then he shakes our hand and then he backs out of the room. He said, anything you want, I'll come back anytime. And he sort of disappears. That's so precious. Yeah. And we all look at one another and said, we have just found our Jimmy Brooks. That young 14 year old had no resume, no acting experience and tremendous charisma. Insane. He he always had charisma. He, he would just he could walk into the room and he lit it up. Yeah. But at the same time, and it's just like knocking over the light stand. He had um, he was he could be vulnerable. Right. Which is really a lot of what we're looking for in the auditions, because if you're right. if you're able to open yourself up. Right. And, and, you know, when you're acting in front of, you know, 50 people are standing around watching you act. And if you can just be vulnerable and, and draw from deep inside For yourself. Sure. And he was just a natural at that. Wild. So what about some of the other characters like Mia and Nina? Like, wh- what were their auditions like? Do you have any memories from those ones, too? Um, th- and not specific, like they stick in my mind, like okay. um, Aubrey, but what I will tell you is some people came into audition and they weren't right for the role. And I can think of two people in particular, but we liked them so much that we wrote roles for them. That's amazing. One of them was Sarah Barbel Tishar, who became Liberty because she, I forget who she was reading for and she just wasn't right for the part, but boy, we loved her presence on camera. And the other one was Shane Kippel. And we we created Spinner for Shane. Iconic. The same same way back in the olden days, (laughs) olden days, classic days, (laughs) We created the character of Snake for Stefan Brogren, and we created Spike for Amanda Steptoe. They were not in our original list of characters, and, and we created them because we liked the actors. Crazy. Well, they ended and, up being and, and Linda, it, it, it's true, because I wasn't there back in that time. I was the, yeah. I was a lawyer, um, yes. not uh, not on set. But um, did Christine, did, did Spike have Spike hair? Is that, is that how you gave her the name? She came into her audition with all those spikes. Oh my, I thought that that was just like the character. That was her. No, we created the character to fit her. That's incredible. In those days, she did her own hair every day before we went. (laughs) I can't imagine what that must have been like every time on set to do her hair like that herself. She did it herself. That's incredible. Okay, before we go any further talking about my favorite characters, I just want to briefly touch upon like the genesis of the series because reading your memoir, I learned so much about how you, first of all, in your life, but how much like where the influence for these characters and these stories came from. So can you just talk to me a little bit about Between Two Worlds and kind of how that like transformed, I guess, into your desire to create Degrassi? Mm-hmm. Um, between two worlds, as you know, I sort of open my book with that chapter between two worlds, because it really is where my life as sort of a filmmaker and a teacher start colliding. Mm-hmm. And it's those two influences that have been very strong as Degrassi has evolved for sure. And um, I had I had been teaching. And while I was teaching, I was also picking up university courses, trying to study whatever I could in, in the media. So when I moved to Toronto, I started at a new school. I had picked up whatever media courses I, I could. And I had said to my principal, you know, I'd love to do some experimenting with my kids and, and the media. And he said, oh, yeah, that's fine. Linda, that's fine. But teach the basics. So you know, <laughs> I taught the basics. But I was in Toronto and I was standing in front of these a most diverse group of kids than I'd ever seen before in my life. And, you know, they were from all over and they were, they had Asian backgrounds and they were from the islands and they were from Italy and they, their families spoke different languages at home. And I started thinking to myself, what's it like for these kids to come to school and fit into the Canadian experience and mm-hmm. then go home and experience a completely different world. And uh, and I had experienced that a bit because I was an immigrant kid from British, a British background. Mm-hmm. And, and yet I was a white kid and I spoke English and I still felt like an outsider. So I started talking to my kids about this and and they, and they we sort of would do it in English class and we would write compositions about it. And 
um, they had really interesting stories to tell. So I went to my principal and I said, you know what? I think there's a documentary in here somewhere. And he said, oh, yeah, it's nice, Linda. Go back, stick to the basics. <laughs> but then a few months later, I got a, a, a call down to his office. And then, of course, you know, even when you're a grown woman and a teacher, you get called to the principal's office and it's like, oh, whoops, what did I do wrong? Yeah. So I go in and and he said, close the door. I said, I've been thinking about your idea about our kids from all these different backgrounds. And he said, Pierre Elliott Trudeau is just um, starting a new multi um, multicultural campaign across Canada. And he's put pockets of money across the country to, um, you know, move this this forward. Yeah. And he said, I've got a little bit of that money. I'd like to put that into your movie. And it was like, oh, my God. That's wild. <laughs> <I'm not doing laughs> <a> movie. <laughs> And, and so really, but, but between two worlds, um, encompassed really was in some ways the early Degrassi yeah. because it, it encompassed so many of the same themes. Right. But what was very critical about that is it was own kids owning their stories, telling their stories from their perspective. And even though I was doing it in a documentary way, that became the basis for how all scripts would be written on Degrassi going forward, right? Right. And that show very much like broke boundaries. And I remember even just myself being in eighth grade and ninth grade. And there were certain storylines that like very much resonated with me in a way that I I couldn't even believe that I was seeing it on TV. Like I have very vivid memories of like watching the episodes with, where Ellie was dealing with cutting and like really freaking out that I was seeing this on the screen because I had a friend who was dealing with the same thing and I was kind of harboring that secret for her and to see it being portrayed so honestly and authentically and like shamelessly was mm. such a turning point for me. And I think that around that era is when I realized like, this is more than a TV show. Like this is almost like putting up a mirror to like my friends and my life. And I mean, I'm going to be, I'll be the first one to say, like, I had a very sheltered, very privileged life. Like, I grew up in Montreal in an Anglophone area. I went to private school, Jewish private school. Like, we were a very, like, calm group of young kids who were really not rebellious. And even just seeing, like, a struggle that many people weren't talking about, seeing it so openly on the screen was so jarring, but also so, like, leveling in a way that, like, I never had experienced before. And reflecting on my early time, like days watching Degrassi, like to this day, that's something that still sticks with me. Well, and, and the cutting episode, first of all, if I can confess, I'm so naive. I did not know cutting existed until we yeah. did the cutting episode. Yeah. But of course the real fear was, and it's, uh, and it's a fear whenever you're dealing with something like this. And certainly when we were dealing with suicide, but with cutting, you do not want copycat. You don't want to sensationalize it. Right. You, you want to do it exactly the right way. So we would speak with experts, but I know Linda, you spent hours in the editing room deciding just exactly what can you can you show? Can can there be a, a speck of blood or not? Or mm -hmm. you know, what can you do? Um, and you know, we agonize over these things. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, and and in that case, um, the first cut that we had done, we we had a very good effect of the the um, I forget what she was using if it was a compass it was or a compass, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and and um, we had done a special effect and it it you know it looked at she drew it across it bled and we had a psychiatrist look at it and he said you can't show that much blood because he said to some young people seeing that is a trigger right so. Um, again, you know, it is that fine line between do you, you're trying to go out there and be honest and authentic, but you don't want to be sensational. You don't want to push right. people on direction. So we're very mindful of that. And, um, but at the same time, there's no topic that we feel we should not talk about because right. that normalizes it. Right. And, and and by no, by talking about it, we normalize it, and by normalizing it, it takes it out of that dark, scary place and out into the open. A hundred percent. I mean, the same thing goes obviously with the school shooting episode. Like that was also, I mean, at the time, 
it was an, an insane thing to see on TV. And like, you would think you're watching a TV show, like nobody's going to get hurt. Like nothing bad's going to happen. Like it's fictional, it's TV. And then for the character to be like, wound, like for it to be Aubrey's character, like jarring, like basketball player, like such a bright future, like all around lovable person. Like you don't think it's going to happen to hit. And like in the circumstance and the way it happens, like, and it just was so honest and so real. And the show throughout its seasons, even with like, next class like all of the other variations of it like it never shied away from these tough topics and it just executed these storylines in a way that were so so real and exactly how you put it non-sensationalized just like a true honest depiction of what teens are going through at that time and and the very important thing is um it happens to a main character Mm -hmm. A character that people love. It's mm -hmm. not somebody is brought in to, you know, have a baby and, you know, maybe an abortion and that. No, no, it right. has to be our main character. And if somebody's going to be the victim of a random shooting like JT. Yeah. That was a shocking episode. Shocking. Uh, but, it, but it happened to a main character, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the suicide with Cam. Yeah. And um, and texting and driving with Adam, who is one of the favorite characters of you. And it, it always I always wondered why Adam was so loved by our fans, because, you know, and at the time it was um, a bit groundbreaking to have a trans character you know, sure. on, on national television. But we realized that when you're a teenager, and I certainly remember doing this, you feel like you're a misfit. You are an outcast. Even if you're popular, you still think you're a misfit. Yeah. And so everyone could relate to the fact that Adam was a misfit. Yeah. And But, you know, even the misfits, even, even if you're trans, it doesn't protect you. If you're texting 100%. and driving, bad 100%. things can happen. A hundred percent. The show also just brought in so many amazing, diverse characters. Like, I just like all of the LGBTQ characters and all the characters of different racial backgrounds and like coming from different types of families, different types of like all, all different backgrounds. It just was so eye opening for me, especially being somebody that was not experiencing that firsthand given my upbringing. I really feel I know this is crazy to say, but by the time that I left high school and I went to CJEP because I grew up in Quebec and I was now all of a sudden in this very big pool of diverse people, I felt like I was more prepared than all of my peers who didn't watch Degrassi because I was like, oh, it's like, it's like, whatever, like all the people that I watch on TV, on my favorite TV show, these are the people that I'm going to school with. Like, it just really, like, I feel like just like normalized me in a way that I really needed. It really grounded me in a very transitional time. That's, I'm, I'm, that makes me so happy to hear you say that. And <laughs> it's interesting that you led with Between Two Worlds, because let's face it, that's where I became exposed to it. And, and I really wanted, I, I was really hoping we would connect with audiences exactly the way you have just yeah. described. Yeah. You know, we were, we, we were doing diversity long before people talked about that word. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So reading your memoir, there were so many like little stories and little like anecdotes that I really, really loved being just like a diehard Degrassi fan. But the one moment, and I literally, I wrote this on my phone and I was like, I have to ask you about it because I had no idea, was Emma's character, the naming of her her name <laughs> is the most <laughs> insane. And I feel like people don't know. I don't know if you ever talked about this before the book, but can you share with everybody who's listening or watching right now, like why Emma is named Emma? Because it's genius. <laughs> well, <laughs> pardon me. We had been, um, we were nominated for our second Emmy, and the second Emmy was for the show It's Late. And It's Late is the episode where Spike finds out that she's pregnant. So um, it was a very exciting night, as you can imagine. This little Canadian show is winning uh, an Emmy. And yeah. so we go on stage, and, and I do all the right things, and I thank all the right people. And <laughs> My partner holds up the Emmy and says, and when her baby's born, we're going to call her Emma after the Emmy. <laughs> and, and I looked at him and I went, okay, where did that come from? <laughs> and who Crazy. would have thought that stuck as her name? And then who would have thought that when we came back with Next Generation, that character Emma would be pivotal in the link between the two generations? Right? So we need to talk about that, that time between like, that that variation of Degrassi and then kind of creating Next Generation, like how did you then decide that the story was going to be a Emma's story now and that that was going to link her back to Spike and Snake and everybody from before? Mm, well, I think what happened was my my writing partner and I at the time, Yan Moore, 
we um, we hadn't done Degr- Degrassi had stopped at the end of Schools Out, and but even though it had stopped, it was still going on uh, reruns and still getting a whole new audience, a whole new generation. And after we'd had some distance from it, we said, you know what? It would be really fun to write teen shows again. Mm-hmm. But we didn't start out thinking it was going to be Degrassi. We just started out thinking, okay, you know, and talked about the various parameters that we would have for this show, and then my partner came in, Yan came in one day and he said, Linda, I've just been doing the math here. And I think that Spike's girl, Emma, is just about old enough to go into junior high. And we went, oh my God, that's brilliant. This could be Degrassi the next generation. And that's crazy. It's crazy. (laughs) It was so meant to be. What was it like finding like your Emma, like finding Miriam? Was that an easy casting process? Um, I think Miriam came along pretty early on. And I, I was going to say, I remember Miriam, and and of course she was so young, it, it, gawky, really. <laughs> and um, but I think she was she was one of the first that that we that we settled on because she was such a pivotal role. Then yeah. you have these chemistry reads where right. other where you have auditions coming back where people um, interact with each other, and sometimes there are scenes written even if they. Uh, are just made up scenes just to see how they react with the other characters. So it was pivotal to have Emma there uh, for the chemistry reads. Right. But the most important chemistry read was when she read with Spike. Right. And um, because we needed to know that we had a mother and daughter thing, but it was fine for um, Amanda Steptoe coming in, but for poor Miriam, she was a fan. She was a fan of the show. Right. And so she oh had to go and read with one of her icons <laughs> and, she went out and bought herself a pair of dolphin pants because she thought that they were dolphin stretchy leggings. She <laughs> thought Emma would wear dolphin leggings. And yeah. she said that gave her comfort to do. That's amazing. With Amanda. <laughs> no, that's amazing. I, I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm rewatching now from the beginning. So I'm, I'm still in season one, but those first two episodes still hold up so well, like with Stranger Mm -hmm. Danger online. And it was even now watching it back being in my late 20s, like I'm just as scared now as I was when I was 13 or 12. However, I was watching it that first time was at like, was Miriam as an actress? Like, did did the kids when they? this is my real question, when the kids were like reading the scripts and like knowing what their storylines were being so young, was there any type of like sensitization happening on set? Like, were there any storylines that were coming up that maybe they were like, they never heard of before they hadn't been exposed to, they didn't know how to act to deal with it. Like what must've like, I can't imagine being 13 or 12 or however old Miriam was at the time. And then having to act out a scene like that. Well, and, and Linda, I'm going to ask you because I think I know, but I'm, I'm, I won't say it and I'll let you do it. There were two actors that, had a kissing scene, but they'd actually never kissed in real life. So we had to send them off to uh, to a room to practice kissing. But, but I think that's a really good question. Um, basic, when we did the read-throughs, which we did before we published the scripts, mm-hmm. we would sit down with all the cast and the writers and the producers in a room, and we would read the script through. Now, for the most part, the young cast didn't get the script beforehand. And okay. the reason was we wanted... To because they were the age of our audience, right? So it was really important for us to see how they responded to it. And a lot of times they would bring up comments in the read-through that would then get incorporated before we would publish the final script. Okay. However, when we had to do something like you brought up the cutting show or, um, or the shooting show with Jimmy, for those shows, I would have a private meeting with that actor before the read-through. Okay. And I would let them know, this is what's going to be happening to mm-hmm. your character. Like for instance, JT, we had to have him in and, right. and talk to him about that. Um, but the rest of the cast weren't prepared. Okay. But then we also, um, we worked with um, Kids Help Phone to get experts. We worked with um, other organizations. So um, if if we needed to bring in experts to help them, I remember um, Stacey Farber was talked through with a psychiatrist about what, what this all meant. Okay. I remember when we did an uh, episode on mental illness, Jake Epstein well, um, oh my gosh, we all love do. him. <laughs> I saw him on Broadway. I couldn't not go when he was in Beautiful. I had to go. 
Yes. Oh, you saw that? Oh, yeah, incredible. Uh, we saw him, um, a spider, Spider-Man. <laughs> yes, incredible, incredible. So many of them have now gone on to do like play stuff. I saw Jake Goldsby did something in Montreal at the Siegel Center. I saw him and he was incredible, like right before oh. COVID. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, and have you seen Jake's uh, one man show? No. Uh, Dog Meets God, or I, I forget no. exactly what the title is. Oh, it's brilliant. But it's him talking the about The Boy Who Fell to Earth. The Boy Who Fell to Earth. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's and, over now. and it's got music in it. It was it ran for about eight weeks at, wow. uh, at the Royal Alex. And it's Jake talking about his life. And one of the things he talked about on was behind the scenes on Beautiful. Yeah. How difficult that was because he was playing an evil character. But in real life, uh, this was Carol King's husband. In yeah. real life, Harry Goffin, he had some some real problems, but he wasn't an evil person. Right. And um, and so that really, I think, destroyed Jake. And that came came across in, wow. in his one man show. And of course, doing Spider Man, you know, yeah. just the um, it, it was so physically Crazy. difficult. I yeah. never saw Spider Man, but my brother and my dad went, and they loved it. And also, I now that we're talking about Jake. When I think I was in grade four or grade five, so Degrassi, I was watching Degrassi, but I was young. Um, Jake's mom is an author and she wrote a book and came to our library. And I remember like everybody in my class got a book for her to sign it. And I remember like wanting to talk to her about her son and like my teacher being like, this is not appropriate. And I just wanted to be like, <laughs> but I have to, I can't not, I can't not ask about Craig. Like, it's so funny. <laughs> so crazy. So when do you like, just getting back to the show, at what point did you notice like, okay, this is really, really taking off? Like, was it like, at, at what point even across Canada, but even internationally? Like when, was there a kind of an aha moment? That's a hard one to answer um, because we did um, like Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High, mm -hmm. which we call the classic Degrassis, did incredibly well internationally. Um, and it when we had a, a, a distributor, Ismay Benny, and she used to come back from the international markets and tell us, you know, it had been bought by this and bought mm -hmm. by that country. Uh, and then we would start getting fan mail coming in from all over the world. And it was like, right. oh, smoke, what's this little Canadian show? But Stephen, you might want to tell this story because I think probably the moment that we realized we've hit a whole new dimension was when we were in New Jersey, right, with Lauren and Marco and, and Donald. Yeah, well, we used to do these um, uh, tours, uh, okay. these mall tours in the States, and it was really fun for the kids because they'd go, they'd go down. There'd usually be two of them, okay. and they went all over the United States and Canada, but it was really in the United States, and there would be eight, 10,000 fans lined up. And um, Linda and I would have a good time sort of going along the line outside and just chatting <laughs> with the fans. I'm sure. Um, but one time we had a, it was it was kind of a spinal tap moment. Okay. <laughs> because we, we were backstage with the CTV executives and uh, trying to find our way out to the uh, <laughs> to, to, to where Adamo and Lauren would be signing. The, and finally we got to the right door. And it was this big, you know, like 20 foot tall door that had to be pulled, you know, to the side. Yeah. And uh, and, and, and the, the person who was guiding us there and the security guard said, OK, are, do you know what's going to happen? And we said, well, yeah, we know what's going to happen. And they said, I don't think you do know what's going to happen. And they opened the door and it was just a wall of absolute screaming. You couldn't mm -hmm. hear anything. And m my very first concert was the Beatles yeah. at the <laughs> Gardens in Toronto. Crazy. And it was just like that. Flashes going off, screaming, and, you know, needing security guards to get uh, Lauren and Adamo to the, to the table where they Crazy. could. Crazy. Uh, yeah. And it was, it, it got, it, we had to cancel this or, or end the mall tours because I think even at that one, when we got near the end of the time and there were some kids who had been waiting in line for hours and hours and hours, they'd been waiting overnight and suddenly realized they might not get their chance to, to okay. meet them, started to press forward. And so the fire department and the police just came in and they they, they were not gentle. They oh pulled Adamo up by, by the shoulders and threw him into a, uh, into a, into a cop car and got, <laughs> got him and Lauren just out of there. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, I remember growing up like Lauren, like Paige being an 
icon. Like everybody wanted to be like Paige. I remember my friend dressed up as her for Halloween and (laughs) everybody like, even to this day, I see hilarious memes whenever there's like something terrible happening in the world. There's always like that one meme that goes around. That's like, well, Paige Michael Chuck could fix it. Like she would be able to solve it. Like she was an iconic character, like beloved. I I I I was new page. Yeah. (laughs) I was watching some clips today um, for some work that I'm doing, and I don't know if you remember it, when she and Alex got stoned when they had to go into the university fair. Yes. I had forgotten how funny that scene was. and how good. Amazing. Lauren was in terms of trying to play it so straight and wanted to go into this university. Yeah, yeah. There's so many good moments from that show. And like, I feel like it just, again, it stands the test of time, but I will not forget ever waking up. I guess it was like three more, three years ago when the I'm upset Drake music video dropped. My friend who I used to always watch Degrassi with sent me it. And she was like, I'm not going to even tell you what this is. Just click play. And it must've been like 9am when I saw like the Degrassi Panthers, like the outside sign, I literally lost my mind. I was like, no, no, no. Like, Who's going to be in this? And then like all everybody, like all the stops, like everyone was in this video. Was that so nice to see everyone reunited? I imagine you both were there in some capacity. Like, what was that like? I, I was actually there. Um, Linda, you were uh, you were out of the really, out I was, town. I was sick at the time. And it was oh. I was so upset. I was, you could talk about being upset, right? <laughs> Stephen went. Stephen was sick. It, it was it was magic. First of all, it was uh, it was shot over three days. The, the, the last day was one of those beautiful, beautiful summer nights where the sun is setting. Yeah. And you sort of you walk into the back lot, and pe- people are coming up to you, and you're you're seeing them for the you know the first time in a long while. I remember Nina coming rushing over from you know from far away. I was like, yeah. oh my god, Nina. <laughs> and uh, then somebody patted me and said, oh, there's somebody over there who wants to say hi. And of course, it was Aubrey. Yeah. And you know you hug and you do that and um every there was such good feeling and kevin smith had written the script for it for it and kevin (laughs) was there we spent a long time with him yes uh it was just a beautiful beautiful time um and uh it it was it was in in a way kind of funny for me because we had already sold the building by then okay and um in fact sold the company Mm -hmm. Uh, So we were invited back just just to be part of it. Mm -hmm. So I was used to, and Linda and I were used to parking at the, you know, the parking spots right in the very front. Well, I I came in and was parking down the street, (laughs) came came in to the security guard of our building and had to introduce myself and and call Ian Christensen to come and get me okay (laughs) to go into the back lot that we had built. (laughs) Crazy. No, but that is just like an iconic piece of pop culture that I feel like forever and ever like I go back and rewatch that video all the time like it's so when they're like in the the hallways like on those like little tricycle things like Nina on the track it's just crazy and then like Stefan with like the the drugs with Kevin like all of that is just so wild the whole thing it's just an insane crazy video but it's such a good like nostalgic throwback yeah yeah it's amazing speaking of Kevin this is kind of my last little question about the show and it kind of ties into him i read the article that he did in people magazine when he talked about when he had his heart attack he kind of thought about the degrassi theme song whatever it takes and the theme song is just so 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 iconic like you hear the first few bars and you just automatically know what's like what it is how involved were either of you with the theme song when you heard it for the first time were you like okay this is it like i would love to know about that well, talking about hearing it for the first time, yeah. two friends and I wrote the song. Okay. And um, I had actually started out, because I'm a real fan of uh, Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys. Okay. And there's a song that they do called Be True to Your School, where there's a chorus in the background, sort of chanting, rah, 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 sis, boom, ba. So okay. I said, we should have something like, like, like a kid's chorus or something yeah. like that as a counterpoint to it all. And I was thinking in a different way. And then uh, my friends, Jody and uh, Jim McGraw, Jody Claro and Jim McGraw, we just sat there in the studio and worked it up. And gradually it came together um, as this song. And of course we added the uh, the children's choir to it. And, uh, and it just worked. Now, Linda, I forget when you first heard the song because we, we probably worked on it for, you know, a few weeks before you would have heard it. Well, and I also remember the timing of when you were working on it, because you were working on it while we were shooting 
uh, it was in 2001 while we were shooting season one. And we were coming towards the end of the season and um, the, the post people and Stephen was working with them to do the music. And then um, September the 11th happened. Mm. And the whole, like our whole set went quiet, right? And and it was, it, it Stephen and I had to, to, to go in and, and talk to everybody. It was just like a, a defining moment as it was for so many people's lives. Mm-hmm. And we, we realized that this was the first time that this generation had fin- had experienced anything as traumatic as this. And we knew that our show had to be hopeful. Mm-hmm. And I think that this song coming out of that time was exactly what, what the show needed and what kids needed to hear. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it just, it was, it was, it just felt so great the first time I heard it. Mm-hmm. It fits perfectly. And, and of course, um, in the I'm Upset video, the last few minutes of, of it are, yes. are the Jesse theme song. <laughs> and now I don't know if you've seen, cause I haven't seen, I would love to see it having, you know, written the song, Kevin Smith's uh, Clerks 3. Apparently it's in it, right? It, it's yeah. in it because, yes. and it's, it's, it's a real life thing because as you alluded about four or five years ago, Kevin had a heart attack. He was given odds are that he was going to die. Yeah. He really knew that it, this would be it. And he was a very large man at the time mm-hmm. and, and he was being wheeled into the operating room. And as he tells it, the thing that kept him going was he said, whatever it takes, I know I can make it through. And he was sort of singing this song and that sort of, and then when he woke up, he was still thinking of that song and he'd made it through. Well, in Clerks 3, and I want, I want to see the scene, uh, the main character has a heart attack. Mm-hmm. And of course, that's when uh, when the song comes through. So I'd love to see what Kevin did with that. You have to see it. It, it sort of brings tears to my eyes thinking about it. That's incredible. That's incredible. I mean, like forever and ever, I'll hear that song. Like if I, whatever, I hear it passing anywhere. I'm like, oh, Degrassi, like my ears yeah. pick up. You know, you, you hear it and you remember right away. But yeah, no, this has been such, such, such a treat. Obviously, you can tell how much I love the show and how much of an impact it has on my life. But it's been so nice getting to chat with you both. I loved both of your books. Stephen, I read your book as well. And I really learned so much about you and your career and your law history and your music background. And just all of it is insane and how you're able to both like come together and create these shows, which is it's it's just had a lasting impact and it continue. It will forever, I'm sure. Well, that's the plan. I mean, I think we're looking forward to being the grandparents of the next next generation. <laughs> I love it. We need more Degrassi, so let's let's hope let's manifest that. Yes, let's yeah, make absolutely. that happen. <laughs> love it. Okay, well, thank you both so so much for your time. This was such a treat. I had the best time chatting with you both. Thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> I'm you. Enthusiasm. <laughs>